We're gonna get started. My name is Dustin. Uh, I'm DI on GitHub. I work at PromptWorks, which is a consultancy in Philadelphia who I would like to thank for sponsoring my work in the open source community, but also um, this talk, which I call Watt, Mind-Bending Edge Cases in Python. Uh, so we're gonna talk about some Watts in Python, and you might ask, what is a Watt? Um, Watts are not trick questions. They're not bugs in the language. Um, Watts are like edge cases in the language that make you say, what? There we go, sorry. Um, they seem weird, but if you actually understand how they happen or why they happen, they actually end up making sense. So we're gonna look at 10 different watts, and to make things interesting, a few are actually gonna be impossible, and so you'll need to decide whether they are actually real or not. So let's start with an example, which I'll call watt number zero, just to get started. So uh, the first goal here is just to determine if this watt is possible or not. And if it is possible, what can we replace the ellipsis with to make it uh, the desired re result uh, true? So in this case, we want to set x equal to some value, and we want to say when x uh, is compared with itself, it's false, it's not itself. Um, so the missing values in these watts are just gonna be only limited to the, the built-in primitive types and collections. So these are booleans, integers, strings, lists, sets, and combinations of these, right? So no lambdas, no partials, classes, or other tricky business like bytecode or anything like that. So who thinks this is possible and definitely can be done in Python? Raise your hand. Okay, who thinks this is definitely not possible and is an abomination in the eyes of Guido Van Rossum? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who's just not sure if this is possible or not? Okay, so those that raised your hand the first time, this actually is possible. And so if we set x equal to zero times one times 10 to the power of 309, it turns out that x is not equal to itself. And the reason for this is because zero times one e 309 is not a number in Python. And that's how it's interpreted by, uh, by Python. And this is the same as saying zero times infinity, which we can get by calling float inf, or just float nan. That's not a number in Python, and it's never equal to itself. So let's talk about NAND for just one second. Uh, there's a really good reason why NAND's not equal to itself or anything else, and it's because it's just not a number, right? Uh, NAND's designed to like propagate through all your calculations, so somewhere if you produce something that's not a number, it kind of like bubbles up, and it doesn't let you continue your, your, whatever you're doing. So because of this, NAND is actually the source of like lots of watts in Python, and in other languages too. And in fact, it's the star of Gary Bernhardt's kind of infamous talk called Watt also which is definitely the inspiration for this talk. And um, does anyone know what language that is? It's not Python. Yeah, that's JavaScript, of course. Um, so in Python, there's a number of actually sensible ways to generate NAN, and none of them are equal to themselves. And so for the purposes of this talk, uh, NAN is also not the answer to any of the questions, because it turns out just when you set things equal to NAN, lots of weird stuff happens. All right, so the first uh, watt that I'm gonna discuss. Can we create a list which is set equal to x. When sliced by a, b, and c, it actually has a new max. So the max of a list x will give you the biggest thing in that list. And then a, b, and c, that's the slice notation, so we're sort of like taking a, a chunk of that list. And we're actually saying that the max of one is less than the max of some subset of that list. Who thinks this is possible? Who thinks this is not possible? I guess everyone else is not sure. So this is actually not possible, right? Uh, we will, when we compare the, some, some subset of the list to the list, no matter how you slice it, no matter what you give as the slice arguments, uh, the maximum of the entire thing is always going to be the largest value. You can't ever produce some value that's larger. So number two, can we make a, an x and a y such that the minimum of x and y is not the same thing as the minimum of y and x. This depends on the order of the arguments to min. Does anybody think that this is possible? Anyone think it's not possible? This y is actually possible, but it's only possible if we set x equal to uh, some set, such as the set containing zero, and y equal to some other set with a different value, such as one. But it's only if x and y are sets. The reason for this is 
kind of uh, a little bit strange. If we take the minimum of the set containing zero and the set containing one, we get the set containing zero. But if we do the opposite, we get the set containing one. So it just sort of seems like min is broken here, right? It's just returning whatever the first argument that we pass it. Unless we look at it like this, if we pass min of the set containing zero and one and the set containing zero, we get the set containing zero. So maybe not, maybe it's not broken. So let's imagine what the min function might look like if we implemented it in Python. So the min function can take any number of arguments and it finds the min of all of them. Uh, it could also take just one, which would be an iterator, but we're gonna ignore that for now. So we're gonna have two variables in our function. Has item tells us if uh, min item has been set yet. And min item holds the smallest item found at any point when we're going over the list of arguments. So next thing we'll do is go over, iterate through the list of arguments. And if has item has not been set yet, or if uh, the current uh, argument is less than the minimum argument that we've found, we set has item to true, and we return min item, or we set min item to x, and then finally we return min item. So this is really simplified. This is not really actually what happens. Um, but for the purposes of this watt, this is what happens. So uh, the key here is that less than operator all the way up in the if not has item or x less than min item, uh, which is comparing x to min item. So the less than operator works just as you'd expect for something like integers. So zero is less than one, true. But when we compare it with, when we use sets as with the comparison operator, uh, it behaves a little differently because it's overloaded. So specifically, it's the inclusion operator. So here it's actually checking if what's in the set on the left side is included in the set on the right side. So zero is not included in the set containing one, but zero, or zero is, com is contained in the set containing zero and one. So that returns true. And so when we say min of zero and one with two one element sets, we'll always get the first element back regardless. All right, what number three. Can we create two lists, x and y, such that at least one element in x is true? That's what any does. It looks at all of them and, and tries to see if any of them are truthy. And it, when we add uh, the variable y to x or append to it, um, there is, there is not any elements that are true. Anyone think this why is possible? Anyone think it's not possible? Definitely never possible. This is actually not possible. So no matter what we add to x, if there is some truthy value in it, it will not change what's in x if we add y to it. So the elements in y have no effect on what's in x. And anything in x, if that's true, uh, the entire any will be true as well. So number four, if we have two variables, x and y, can we, set, uh, can we set x such that the number of times that y appears in x is more than the length of x? So this y is actually possible. So if we set x to really any string at all, and we set y to the empty string, uh, when we do the length of the original string x, we get something like six. But if we count the number of empty strings in that string, we get actually more than the actual length of the string. And so let's imagine what the count function might look like. So to make things easy, let's just make a function that takes a string a s and a substring. And so we'll initialize the result to return zero. So that's the zero counts have been found so far. We'll iterate through all the indexes at which the substring could start in S. So this is gonna save us some search space, right? Like uh, if S is a short string, like three characters long, and substring is longer, there is no possible place where that substring can occur in the string. So uh, the range will end up being an empty list. If they're the, exactly the same length, we only get one index into that original search string, which is zero. So that's the only place that the substring can occur. Uh, if uh, the substring is shorter than the original string, we get a series of indices. These are all the possible places where the substring can occur in foobar. But if the substring is an empty string, this range function actually ends up giving us one extra index, one extra place to look in the sequence, which isn't actually a location in the original string. And so when we go and get our substring, our possible match out of the original string, we take a slice that looks like this, and again, if s is longer than the substring, we get uh, something like uh, 
the, the slice of the same size. And if the substring is an empty string, though, we just get another empty string. So the slice from 0 to 0, or really from any integer to the same integer, is just always going to give us an empty string. And actually, slicing won't raise an index error, even when the index is longer than the string. So we could do slice of 42 to 42, and it'll still just keep giving us an empty string, even if the original string is not that long. So to continue our function, if the possible match is equal to the substring, we inc increment the result. So in this case, we're comparing the possible match, which is always going to be an empty string, with the substring, which is also an empty string. So we're going to increment result seven times instead of the original six, the length of the string. And so as we see, for an empty string, the range of the indices is zero through six, or seven total, and the possible match gives us uh, matches every single time, so this gives us a total count of seven. All right, number five. Uh, is it possible? So we were all sort of told in high school, order of operations for multiplication, not important, right? So is it possible in Python to have uh, three variables, x, y, and z, such that when we multiply y and z and then multiply it by x, it produces a different result than when we multiply x and y and then multiply it by z? Does anyone think this is possible? A lot of people do. OK. I'm surprised by that. Anyone think it's not possible? Some people. OK. So this is actually possible. Uh, and it's possible if we set x equal to uh, some list, such as the list containing 0, and y and z both equal to negative 1. So um, in this case, when we multiply y and z, we get negative 1 times negative 1, which produces 1. And then when we multiply any list by 1, we get itself. So this also becomes 0. So this left-hand side of the equation produces the list containing 0, the original value of x. However, um, on the other hand side of the equation, when we multiply a list by an, a negative number, um, does anyone know what happens? We actually uh, end up producing an empty list, because it's the same as multiplying the list by 0. And then when we multiply an empty list by negative 1, again, this yields an empty list. So in this way, the two different sides of the equation are totally different. So actually, there's one other way that I found uh, to satisfy this function, which is a little crazy. If we set uh, x, y, and z equal to some very specific numbers, we can exploit some of the ways that Python handles floating point numbers. And uh, actually, the result of this multiplication is that, and that is off by just like the tiniest little least significant bit. And I can't totally explain this. I haven't been able to look into it enough. But um, basically, you know, floats are not always exactly what they seem. All right, so for number six, uh, can we define two lists, x and y, such that x is less than y, but when we compare each individual element, every element in x, uh, when we compare each individual element, every element in uh, x is greater than or equal to y? So we're actually going to take two lists. We're going to zip them together, which is when we take two and we just sort of combine them as tuples. And then we're going to say that every uh, element in one is actually greater than the other. So this y is actually possible. And the way to do it is, again, if uh, x is any zero length iterable and y is really any iterable at all. So here we'll use the empty string again and a string called foobar. So what happens here is the comparison operator is just a lexicographical ordering. So an empty string comes before foobar, just like dog would come before dogfish uh, in the alphabet. Uh, and in the same way, empty lists come before non-empty lists. So when we zip a, an empty iterable with some iterable up with a length, the result is actually just still, an, uh, th they have two uneven lengths. So the result will be the, the iterable of the shorter length. And when it's an empty string, we just get an empty list. And when we check for all of an empty list, it short circuits. So it goes through and it looks to see if anything will return false. If it does, it returns false. But otherwise, it just returns true. So all of an empty list is actually true. All right, what number seven? Um, can we set x equal to something such that the when we cast x to a list and then to a set and then we check the length of it, it's not the same thing as uh, casting x to a set, then to a list in opposite order, and checking the length of that. Does anyone think that this is possible? Does anyone think this is not possible? Definitely never possible. This watt is not possible. 
So no matter what we set x to, converting it from a list to a set might actually reduce the length of x, right? The list could have duplicate values. The set would eliminate them. But converting a set to a list is always, it's never going to add elements. It's always going to be the same. So in this case, uh, there's nothing that we can set x to such that this equation ends up being false. Number eight, uh, can we make an x such that the minimum of x is not the same as the minimum of x unpacked? So this is sort of talking about what I said earlier about min is that min might take a number of arguments or it might take an interval, right? Anyone have an idea if this is possible? Russell thinks maybe. Anybody else? This y is possible. Uh, so if we set x equal to a list containing another list containing like something like zero, um, it, it, this, is, this is the result. So this y exists because, of the, the, like I said, the different way that min handles its arguments. So minimum of, uh, of the list containing one, two, three is the same as the minimum of containing one, two, three unpacked, which is the same as min of one, comma, two, comma, three. These are all the same. So the min of x is just the, the first element in it, right? So this returns the list of containing zero. And, but the min of x unpacked is the min of the list containing zero, which is just zero. So when we unpack x, we get that list back and then take the min of that iterable and then it's just that single element. So this way we can see that min of x produces a different value than the min of x unpacked. All right, number nine. Uh, can we have two values, x and y, such that the sum of zero times whatever x is with uh, y as a starting value is, equal to, is not equal to y? So this is a sort of, I don't know, we don't use this uh, feature of sum too often, but sum takes two arguments. One is an interval, and the other is a starting value. So it's where it starts the sum. It sort of adds it to the beginning of the summation. Does anyone think this watt is possible? Anyone think it's not possible? OK, this watt is not possible. I'll say that confidently. Anything times 0 is going to be either 0 or it's going to be an empty sequence. And the sum of 0 or the sum of an empty sequence is always going to be 0. So no matter what we start this starting value at, uh, the result is always going to be the same. So here, y is the start of sum, uh, which is 7. Sum of three ones would be 10. Sum of an empty list would still be 7. So this would always end up being, uh, if, if x is multiplied by 0, always equal to the starting value. And last is number 10. This is my favorite watt of all of them. I saved it for last. Um, can we find two values? x and y such that y is greater than the maximum value in x, but y is also contained in x. I'll let you think for just for one second, because I like this one so much. Who thinks that this is possible? Who thinks that it is not possible? This y is actually possible, but it only works uh, if we set x equal to a string, such as AA, and y is also that exact same string. I see some people nodding, which is great. Um, so this is the only way that it works. And well, the reason why this works is because um, Python uses the in operator a little bit differently for strings than for lists. So the max of a string containing like AA is just going to return in a single character. So it's going to take that iterable just like min was doing and find the biggest one. In this case, it's just A. Uh, and because of a lexicographical ordering, like I mentioned before, um, A is going to precede AA, just like dog precedes dog fish. But also, um, like I said, Python handles in a little bit differently. So here we're actually doing like a substring match, right? We're checking to see if the substring AA is in the full string AA, which is true because the strings are the same. And this is different than the way we would do it for a list, right? Like we could turn the string AA into a list containing the characters A and A, but then AA wouldn't be in that list. So this is false. All right, so one last thing I want to say. Um, these watts seem really like technically interesting, right? Um, they're really quirky, they're really simple questions, but I can almost guarantee that you have never encountered these in the wild. In fact, I've been writing Python for a long time and I've only seen like one or two of these. Uh, and so the only reason I really have to share them with you is because a really smart fellow named Christopher Knight collected a bunch of them and put them online somewhere. I never even saw them in person. So this is why I have to ask you, please uh, don't use these for job interviews. Uh, <laughs> 
it seems really tempting, but uh, if you didn't know the answer to them when I first showed them, I guarantee your interviewee is not going to know them either. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, my employer, PromptWorks, for sending me here. Thanks to Christopher Knight for introducing me to these. Thanks to Pi Gotham for the event, and uh, thanks to you all for listening. I have any questions. So if you think you have a lot that is disproving something in my list, um, you can come up to me afterwards, and we can open up an interpreter, and we can, we can take a look at it. Um, but if you have any other questions about the way that these functions work or why one thing is one way or another, um, feel free to ask it now. Right, so the, so the question, to just to repeat it, is basically saying that uh, if you watch the original Gary Bernhardt's talk about Watts in JavaScript, all those Watts are just like, they really don't actually make any sense. But these Watts in Python, when you look at them, they, they're actually, they make sense. Like, this is the way that the language should work. They're not bugs. They're not, like, really poorly designed edge cases of the language. Like, these, these functions, this is the way that they should work. And, yeah, like you said, with the exception of the last one, which is sort of like a ambiguous way in which Python just sort of like helps us out because when we're comparing strings, we really want to know if a substring is in a string and not if a character is in a string. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, this is one of the ways that we can see that Python is a really well designed language um, because these watts are just, we had to look, look pretty hard to find these watts too. They're not uh, as immediately obvious as the ones that Gary talks about in his talk. Uh, I'd recommend watching that if uh, it'll make that. That talk will give you a good appreciation for how good our language is compared to JavaScript. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thanks again, everybody.